you have to give up complaining. The man who complains about the way the ball bounces is likely the one who dropped it. Lou Holtz. The only coach in NCAA history to lead six different college teams to postseason bowl games, and winner of a national championship and Coach of the Year honors, now an ESPN football analyst. Let's take a moment to really look at complaining. In order to complain about something or someone, you have to believe that something better exists. You have to have a reference point of something you prefer that you are not willing to take responsibility for creating. Let's look at that more closely. If you didn't believe there was something better possible, more money, a bigger house, a more fulfilling job, more fun, a more loving partner, you couldn't complain. So you have this image of something better, and you know you would prefer it, but you are unwilling to take the risks required to create it. Complaining is an ineffective response to an event that does not produce a better outcome. Think about this. People only complain about things they can do something about. We don't complain about the things we have no power over. Have you ever heard anyone complain about gravity? No, never. Have you ever seen an elderly person all bent over with age, walking slowly down the street with the aid of a walker, complaining about gravity? Of course not. But why not? If it weren't for gravity, people wouldn't fall down the stairs, planes wouldn't fall out of the sky, and we wouldn't break any dishes. But nobody complains about it. And the reason is because gravity just exists. There is nothing anyone can do about gravity, so we just accept it. We know that complaining will not change it, so we don't complain about it. In fact, because it just is, we use gravity to our advantage. We build aqueducts down mountainsides to carry water to us, and we use drains to take away our waste. Even more interesting is that we choose to play with gravity, to have fun with it. Almost every sport we play uses gravity. We ski, skydive, high jump, throw the discus and the javelin, and play basketball, baseball, and golf, all of which require gravity. The circumstances you complain about are all situations you can change, but you have chosen not to. You can get a better job, find a more loving partner, make more money, move to where the jobs are, live in a nicer house, and eat healthier food. But all of these things would require you to change. You could learn to cook healthier food. Say no in the face of peer pressure. Quit and find a better job. Take the time to conduct due diligence. Trust your own gut feelings. Go back to school to pursue your dream. Take better care of your possessions. Reach out for help. Ask others to assist you. Take a self-development class. Sell or give away the dogs. But why don't you simply do those things? It's because they involve risks. You run the risk of being unemployed, left alone, or ridiculed and judged by others. You run the risk of failure, confrontation, or being wrong. You run the risk of your mother, your neighbors, or your spouse disapproving of you. Making a change might take effort, money, and time. It might be uncomfortable, difficult, or confusing. And so to avoid risking any of those uncomfortable feelings and experiences, you stay put and complain about it. As I stated before, complaining means you have a reference point for something better that you would prefer, but that you are unwilling to take the risk of creating. Either accept that you are making the choice to stay where you are, take responsibility for your choice and stop complaining, or take the risk of doing something new and different to create your life exactly the way you want it. If you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, of course, you're going to have to take that risk. So make the decision to stop complaining, to stop spending time with complainers, and get on with creating the life of your dreams. Pete Carroll, the coach of the NFL Seattle Seahawks football team, which won the 2014 Super Bowl, has three rules for his team. 1. Always protect the team. 2. No whining, no complaining, and no excuses. And three, be early. These are the rules of a Super Bowl championship team. They are worth adapting. The $2 Game 
Here's an exercise you can do in your home or your office. It's one we do in ours and in our seminars. Find a large jar or a fishbowl and label it No Blaming, No Complaints, No Excuses. Every time you or someone in your group catches themselves blaming someone else, complaining about something, or making an excuse for their lack of results, the offender has to put $2 in the jar, not as punishment, but as a technique to deepen awareness that those behaviors have a cost. You're complaining to the wrong person. Have you ever noticed that people almost always complain to the wrong person? To someone who can't do anything about their complaint? They go to work and complain about their spouse. Then they come home and complain to their spouse about the people at work. Why? Because it's easier. It's less risky. It takes courage to tell your spouse that you are not happy with the way things are at home. It takes courage to ask for a behavioral change. It also takes courage to ask your boss to plan better so that you don't end up working every weekend. But only your boss can do anything about that. Your spouse can't. Learn to replace complaining with making requests and taking action that will achieve your desired outcomes. That is what successful people do. That is what works. If you find yourself in a situation you don't like, either work to make it better or leave. Do something to change it or get the heck out. Agree to work on the relationship or get a divorce. Work to improve working conditions or find a new job. Either way, you will get a change. As the old adage says, don't just sit there and complain, do something. And remember, it's up to you to make the change, to do something different. The world doesn't owe you anything. You have to create it. You either create or allow everything that happens to you. To be powerful, you need to take the position that you create or allow everything that happens to you. By create. I mean that you directly cause something to happen by your actions or inactions. If you walk up to a man in a bar who is bigger than you and has obviously been drinking for a long time and say to him, You are really ugly and stupid. And he jumps off the bar stool, hits you in the jaw, and you end up in the hospital. You created that. That's an easy to understand example. Here's one that may be harder to swallow. You work late every night. You come home tired and burned out. You eat dinner in a coma and then sit down in front of the television to watch a basketball game. You're too tired and stressed out to do anything else, like go for a walk or play with the kids. This goes on for years. Your wife asks you to talk to her. You say, Later, I'm watching the game. Three years later, you come home to an empty house and a note that she has left you and taken the kids. You created that one, too. Other times, we simply allow things to happen to us by our inaction and our unwillingness to do what is necessary to create or maintain what we want. You didn't follow through on your threat to take away privileges if the kids didn't clean up after themselves, and now the house looks like a war zone. You didn't demand he join you in counseling or leave the first time he hit you, so now you're still getting hit. You didn't attend any sales and motivational seminars because you were too busy, and now the new kid just won the top sales award. You didn't make the time to take the dogs to obedience training, and now they're out of control. You didn't take the time to maintain your car, and now you're sitting by the side of the road with your car broken down. You didn't go back to school, and now you are being passed over for a promotion. Realize that you are not the victim here. You stood passively by and let it happen. You didn't say anything, make a demand, make a request, say no, try something new, or leave. Yellow Alerts be aware that nothing ever just happens to you. Just like the yellow alerts in the Star Trek television series and movies, you almost always receive advance warnings in the form of telltale signs, comments from others, gut instinct, or intuition that alert you to the impending danger and give you time to prevent the unwanted outcome. You are getting yellow alerts all the time. They are external yellow alerts. He keeps coming home later and later with alcohol on his breath. The client's first check bounced. He screamed at his secretary. His mother warned you. 
Your friends told you. And there are internal yellow alerts. That feeling in your stomach. That fleeting thought that just may be. That intuition that said. That fear that emerged. That dream that woke you up in the middle of the night. We have a whole language that informs us. Clues, inklings, suspicions. The handwriting on the wall. I had a feeling that I could see it coming for a mile. My gut feeling told me. These alerts give you time to change your response, R, in the E plus R equals zero equation. However, too many people ignore the yellow alerts because paying attention to them would require them to do something that is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to confront your spouse about the cigarettes in the ashtray that have lipstick on them. It is uncomfortable to speak up in a staff meeting when you are the only one who feels that the proposed plan won't work. It is uncomfortable to tell someone you don't trust them. So you pretend not to see and not to know because it is easier, more convenient, and less uncomfortable, avoids confrontation, keeps the peace, and protects you from having to take risks. Life becomes much easier. Successful people, on the other hand, face facts squarely. They do the uncomfortable and take steps to create their desired outcomes. Successful people don't wait for disasters to occur and then blame something or someone else for their problems. Once you begin to respond quickly and decisively to signals and events as they occur, life becomes much easier. You start seeing improved outcomes both internally and externally. Old internal self-talk such as, I feel like a victim, I feel used, nothing ever seems to work out for me, is replaced with, I feel great, I am in control, I can make things happen. External outcomes such as, nobody ever comes to our store, we missed our quarterly goals, people are complaining that our new product doesn't work, are transformed into, we have more money in the bank. I led the division in sales. Our product is flying off the shelves. Simple isn't necessarily easy. Though this principle is simple, it is not necessarily easy to implement. It requires concentrated awareness, dedicated discipline, and a willingness to experiment and take risks. You have to be willing to pay attention to what you are doing and to the results you are producing. You have to ask yourself, your family, your friends, your colleagues, your managers, your teachers, your coaches, and your clients for feedback. Is what I'm doing working? Could I be doing it better? Is there something more I should be doing that I'm not? Is there something I am doing that I should stop doing? How do you see me limiting myself? Don't be afraid to ask. Most people are afraid to ask for feedback about how they are doing because they are afraid of what they are going to hear. There is nothing to be afraid of. The truth is the truth. You are better off knowing the truth than not knowing it. And once you know, you can do something about it. You cannot improve your life, your relationships, your game, or your performance without feedback. Slow down and pay attention. Life will always give you feedback about the effects of your behavior if you'll just pay attention. If your golf ball is always slicing to the right, if you're not making sales, if you're getting C's in all your college courses, if your children are mad at you, if your body is tired and weak, if your house is a mess, or if you're not happy, this is all feedback. It is telling you that something is wrong. This is the time to start paying attention to what is happening. Ask yourself, how am I creating or allowing this to happen? What am I doing that's working that I need to be doing more of? Should I do more practicing, meditating, delegating, trusting, listening, asking questions, keeping my eye on the ball, advertising, saying I love you, controlling my carbohydrate intake? Or what am I doing that's not working? What do I need to be doing less of? Am I talking too much, watching too much television, spending too much money, eating too much sugar, drinking too much, being late too often, gossiping, 
putting other people down? You can also ask yourself, what am I not doing that I need to try and see if it works? Do I need to listen more, exercise, get more sleep, drink more water, ask for help, do more marketing, read, plan, communicate, delegate, follow through, hire a coach, volunteer, or be more appreciative? This book is full of proven success principles and techniques you can immediately put into practice in your life. You will have to suspend judgment, take a leap of faith, act as if they are true, and try them out. Only then will you have first-hand experience about their effectiveness for your life. You won't know if they work unless you give them a try. And here's the rub. No one else can do this for you. Only you can do it. But the formula is simple. Do more of what is working. Do less of what isn't. And try on new behaviors to see if they produce better results. Pay attention. Your results don't lie. The easiest, fastest, and best way to find out what is or isn't working is to pay attention to the results you are currently producing. You are either rich or you are not. You either command respect or you don't. You are either golfing par or you are not. You are either maintaining your ideal body weight or you are not. You are either happy or you are not. You either have what you want or you don't. It's that simple. Results don't lie. You have to give up any excuses and justifications and come to terms with the results you are producing. If you are under quota or overweight, all the great reasons in the world won't change that. The only thing that will change your results is to change your behavior. Prospect more. Get some sales training. Change your sales presentation. Change your diet. Consume fewer calories and exercise more frequently. These are things that will make a difference. But you have to first be willing to look at the results you are producing. The only starting point that works is reality. So start paying attention to what is so. Look around at your life and the people in it. Are you and they happy? Is there balance, beauty, comfort, and ease? Do your systems work? Are you getting what you want? Is your net worth increasing? Are your grades satisfactory? Are you healthy, fit, and pain-free? Are you getting better in all areas of your life? If not, then something needs to happen, and only you can make it happen. Don't kid yourself. Be ruthlessly honest with yourself. Take your own inventory. From Victim to Victory Raj Bafsar was born to be a gymnast. It was the natural career choice for a kid who, at the age of four, lived to climb up things, including trees and furniture, and jump off them. His parents, worried that he'd hurt himself and destroy their house, signed him up for gymnastics classes at a nearby gym. Raj quickly fell in love with the sport, and by the age of ten he wanted to be the best at his sport that he loved and represent his country in the Olympics. He began focusing intensely on becoming a better gymnast, and soon the success began to show. He started winning first and second place at competitions, and was a five-time Texas champion by the time he entered high school. His high school and college years were a blur of awards and championships. Regional state champion, national champion, senior national team, and then placement in two medal-winning championship teams. In his mind, he was unstoppable. In 2004, Raj was competing for a spot in the U.S. Olympic gymnastics team. Of the twelve routines he'd done, eleven of them had been perfect. Everybody agreed that he was a shoe-in. Elated, he was thinking, Greece, here I come. But at the conclusion of the trials, when they read off the names of the Olympians, his wasn't on the list. Then he heard the words, Raj Bobsar, alternate. In that moment, his whole world, everything he'd been working toward for a decade and a half, was shattered. His expectations were sky high and tangled up in his self-worth. So when they weren't met on that awful day in 2004, he came down to earth with a crash. For the next few years, he burned with one desire, to find out why he'd been denied. He needed to find someone to blame. Although Raj went to Greece as an alternate, 
It was a bittersweet experience watching his teammates work together and compete day after day. Unofficially, he was part of the team, yet it was clear he wasn't really one of them. He never had a chance to compete, and he returned from the trip disillusioned and lost. Back at home, he did some serious soul-searching. He asked himself, Do I truly enjoy gymnastics? Do I love the competition regardless of the scores and the accolades? His answer was yes. So he decided to recommit himself to being a gymnast, and this time to throw himself into the sport, not just to win competitions, but for the art of it and the love of it. Unfortunately, without the intense drive to win, his performance suffered. At the 2007 U.S. Nationals, held nine months before the 2008 Olympic team was selected, he bombed. His performance was rocky, and for the first time in nine years he didn't even make the national team. He had to own up to the truth. What he was doing wasn't working. A few days later, a friend of his, a 2000 Olympian himself, handed Raj a book and said, You need to read this. Raj took it from him and saw on the cover a picture of a white-haired guy with a big smile and the words, How to get from where you are to where you want to be. He thought, No book can get me where I want to be. My problem is different. But when his coach recommended the same book a few days later, Raj decided to give it a chance. I'll let Raj tell the rest of the story. The book was The Success Principles, and the first thing I learned was that, to be successful, you have to take 100% responsibility for everything that happens in your life. This was a tough one to swallow, considering I had been convinced for years that life had played against me. Soon, however, I realized that harboring resentment and dwelling on what happened had gotten me nowhere. Suddenly, instead of continuing to look for someone to blame, I began to turn that energy inward and examine how my own mindset of fear and negativity had contributed to my recent performance. Where was my fear coming from, and what was causing these negative thoughts in my head? I had always thought that fear meant I was broken. But Jack taught me that successful people experience fear and negativity on a daily basis, yet still choose to move forward toward their goals. Negative thoughts, rejection, fear, they're just part of the process. Suddenly, these thoughts became challenges to overcome, rather than huge roadblocks or evidence of my failure. I was on a whole new course. My coach saw the light go on in me. It was like a switch was flipped, he said. Working with him on a new training plan, I recommitted to my dream of being an Olympian. But now I also wanted to be an Olympian in life. I created a vision board and mind map, not only to help me visualize success, but also to break down my huge, lofty, overwhelming Olympic goal into areas of daily focus that I could manage. When the 2008 Olympic tryouts were held, I sailed through the competition. I felt happy, clear, and on top of my game. I nailed all my routines. With all the work I'd done on myself, I was confident they would name me to the team this time. But when they named the final team members, my name wasn't called. What? In a cruel repeat of 2004, I heard, Raj Bavzar, alternate. When a reporter from NBC asked me how I felt about being named an alternate a second time, I answered with one sentence. There is no external event that can defeat my sense of inner accomplishment. Still. I was honestly baffled that, after all I had done, my dream was still outside my grasp. While a part of me was ready to give up on being an Olympian, something inside me said, Keep the dream alive. There is no way this is over. The next morning, I called the USA gymnastics officials and reconfirmed that I'd be honored to be an alternate. For the next week, I trained hard and stayed ready. Then it was announced that Paul Hamm, the 2004 Olympic gold medalist and a member of the Olympic team for 2008, had made the decision to withdraw due to injuries. The committee would decide which one of the three alternates would be chosen to replace him. Waiting for the decision was probably the most excruciating yet exciting 24 hours of my entire life. The next day at the gym, my coach, 
My sports performance counselor and I were on the phone to USA Gymnastics when the president of the organization came on the line to give us the official announcement. As he started his announcement, saying how happy they were about the decision, and on and on, inside I was begging, just say the name. Is it me or not? At this time, he finally said, we'd like to announce the new member of the 2008 Olympic team, Raj Bavzar. With a shout, Raj fell to his knees. Then, smiling and crying at the same time, he stood up and hugged his coach. He hugged his counselor. He hugged everyone. But Raj also knew the road ahead would be difficult. With Paul Ham out, not a single member of the team had any Olympic experience. Sports media, even people in the gymnastics community, had written off the team, doubting they could make it into the finals. That was when Raj committed to doing whatever he could to keep their outlook positive. The night before the competition, he assembled all six team members and urged them to commit to caring for each other as human beings first, athletes second. In that moment, each knew that his teammates had his back. The next morning, the team walked onto the competition floor with their heads held high, and in a stunning upset, with the entire arena chanting, USA! USA! Raj and his teammates edged out the Germans to win the Olympic bronze medal. Principle 2. Be clear why you're here. Decide upon your major definite purpose in life, and then organize all your activities around it. Brian Tracy, one of America's leading authorities on the development of human potential and personal effectiveness. I believe each of us is born with a life purpose. Identifying, acknowledging, and honoring this purpose is perhaps the most important action that successful people take. They take the time to understand what they're here to do and then they pursue that with passion and enthusiasm. What were you put on this earth to do? I discovered long ago what I was put on this earth to do. I determined my true purpose in life, my right livelihood. I discovered how to inject passion and determination into every activity I undertake, and I learned how purpose can bring an aspect of fun and fulfillment to virtually everything I do. Now I'd like to help uncover the same secret for you. You see, without a purpose in life, it's easy to get sidetracked on your life's journey. It's easy to wander and drift, accomplishing little. But with a purpose, everything in life seems to fall into place. To be on purpose means you're doing what you love to do, doing what you're good at, and accomplishing what's important to you. When you are truly and passionately on purpose, the people, resources, and opportunities you need naturally gravitate toward you. The world benefits, too, because when you act in alignment with your true life purpose, which may at first glance seem selfish, all of your actions automatically serve others. Some Personal Life Purpose Statements My life purpose is to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in a context of love and joy in harmony with the highest good of all concerned. I inspire people to live their highest vision by collecting and disseminating inspiring stories through the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and in my inspirational keynote speeches. I empower people to live their dreams by writing practical self-help books like this one. Tapping into Ultimate Success and The Power of Focus, by designing courses for high school and college students, and by conducting seminars for individuals and corporations that teach powerful tools for creating one's ideal life both at work and at home. Here are the life purpose statements of some of my friends. It is important to note that they have all become self-made millionaires through the fulfillment of their life purpose to inspire and empower people to achieve their destiny. Robert Allen, co-author of The One Minute Millionaire. To uplift humanity's consciousness through business. D.C. Cordova, co-founder of the Accelerated Business School.
to humbly serve the Lord by being a loving, playful, powerful, and passionate example of the absolute joy that is available to us the moment we rejoice in God's gifts and sincerely love and serve all of His creations. Anthony Robbins, author of Personal Power and Get the Edge, Entrepreneur and Philanthropist. To leave the world a better place than I found it, for horses and for people, too. Monty Roberts, author of The Man Who Listens to Horses. Once you know what your life purpose is, you can organize all of your activities around it. Everything you do should be an expression of your purpose. If an activity didn't align with your purpose, you wouldn't work on it. Period. What's the why behind everything you do? Without purpose as the compass to guide you, your goals and action plans may not ultimately fulfill you. You don't want to get to the top of the ladder only to find you had it leaning against the wrong wall. When Julie Marie Carrier was a child, she was a very big fan of animals. As a result, all she ever heard growing up was, Julie, you should be a vet. You're going to be a great vet. That's what you should do. So when she got to Ohio State University, she took biology, anatomy, and chemistry, and started studying to be a vet. A Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship allowed her to spend her senior year studying abroad in Manchester, England. Away from the family and faculty pressures back home, she found herself one dreary day sitting at her desk, surrounded by biology books and staring out the window, when it suddenly hit her. You know what? I'm totally miserable. What am I doing? I don't want to be a vet. Julie then asked herself, What is a job that I would love so much that I'd do it for free, but that I could actually get paid for? It's not being a vet. That's not the right job. Julie thought back over all the things she'd done in her life and what had made her the most happy. Suddenly, it hit her. It was all of the youth leadership conferences that she had volunteered at, and the communications and leadership courses she had taken as elective courses back at Ohio State. How could I have been so ignorant, she thought. Here I am in my fourth year at school and just finally realizing I'm on the wrong path. But it's been right here in front of me the whole time. I just never took the time to acknowledge it until now. Buoyed by her new insight, Julie spent the rest of her year in England taking courses in communications and media performance. When she returned to Ohio State, she was eventually able to convince the administration to let her create her own program in leadership studies. And while it took her two years longer to finally graduate, she went on to become a senior management consultant in leadership training and development for the Pentagon. She also won the Miss Virginia USA contest, which allowed her to spend much of the year speaking to kids all across Virginia plus launch a national speaking career to empower youth with messages of leadership and character. By the way, Julie was able to do this at only 26 years old, a testament to the power that clarity of purpose can create in your life. Today, Julie has reached over a million young people as one of the top national youth leadership speakers for student conferences, high schools, colleges, and youth programs worldwide. You may have seen her on NBC's Today Show or Fox News in the New York Times or as a success coach for teens and young women featured on a goal-setting TV show on MTV. Julie even received an Emmy nomination. You can learn more about Julie at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. The good news is that you don't have to go all the way to England to discover what you are really here to do. You can simply complete two simple exercises that will help you clarify your purpose. Your inner guidance system is your joy. It is the soul's duty to be loyal to its own desires. It must abandon itself to its master passion. Dame Rebecca West, best-selling author. You were born with an inner guidance system that tells you when you are on or off purpose by the amount of joy you are experiencing. The things that bring you the greatest joy are in alignment with your purpose. To begin to hone in on your purpose, here are a couple of exercises. The first is to make a list of the times you have felt most joyful and alive. 
What are the common elements of these experiences? Can you figure out a way to make a living doing these things? Pat Williams is the senior vice president of the NBA's Orlando Magic basketball team. He has also written more than 70 books and is a professional speaker. When I asked him what he felt the greatest secret to success was, he replied, Figure out what you love to do as young as you can, and then organize your life around figuring out how to make a living at it. For young Pat, it was sports, more specifically, baseball. When his father took him to his first baseball game in Philadelphia, he fell in love with the game. He learned to read by reading the sports section of the New York Times. He knew he wanted to grow up and have a career in sports. He devoted almost every waking moment to it. He collected baseball cards, played sports, and wrote a sports column for the school newspaper. Pat went on to have a career in the front office of the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team, then with the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team. When the NBA considered granting an expansion team franchise to Orlando, Pat was there to lead the fight. Now in his 70s, Pat has enjoyed 50-plus years doing what he loves, and he has enjoyed every minute of it. Once you are clear about what brings you the greatest joy, you will have a major insight into your purpose. The second exercise is a simple but powerful way to create a compelling statement of your life purpose that can guide your behavior. Take time now to complete the following exercise. The Life Purpose Exercise There are many ways to approach defining your purpose. I learned this version of the Life Purpose Exercise from Arnold M. Patton, spiritual coach and author of You Can Have It All. His most recent book is The Journey. You can read more about Arnold at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. 1. List two of your unique personal qualities, such as enthusiasm and creativity. 2. List one or two ways you enjoy expressing those qualities when interacting with others, such as to support and to inspire. 3. Assume the world is perfect right now. What does this world look like? How is everyone interacting with everyone else? What does it feel like? Write your answer as a statement in the present tense, describing the ultimate condition, the perfect world as you see it and feel it. Remember, a perfect world is a fun place to be. Example. Everyone is freely expressing their own unique talents. Everyone is working in harmony. Everyone is expressing love. 4. Combine the three prior subdivisions of this paragraph into a single statement. Example. My purpose is to use my creativity and enthusiasm to support and inspire others to freely express their talents in a harmonious and loving way. Here are some examples of life purpose statements that people in my recent workshops have written. To use my humor, creativity, and knowledge to inspire, uplift, and empower people in recovery to stay sober. Recovery coach and author. To inspire and empower small business owners to systematize for easier revenue generation. Small business consultant and author. To inspire people to have faith in themselves and believe in their natural genius. Educator. To raise healthy, prosperous children who make a difference in the world. Full-time homemaker. To create a world in which people are living ecologically sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, and socially just lives. Environmentalist and social activist. To use my vast knowledge of integrative medicine to educate, inspire, and empower people to live longer and healthier lives. Holistic medical doctor to live every day to the fullest and give back as much as possible while appreciating someone special every day, contractor and home builder, to live my life with integrity and compassion while serving others, and to always value the unexpected, fireman. Staying on Purpose Once you have determined and written down your life purpose, read it every day, preferably in the morning. If you are artistic or strongly visual by nature, 
You may want to draw or paint a symbol or picture that represents your life purpose and then hang it somewhere, on the refrigerator, opposite your desk, near your bed, where you will see it every day. This will keep you focused on your purpose. As you move forward in the next few chapters to define your vision and your goals, make sure they are aligned with and serve to fulfill your purpose. Another approach to clarifying your purpose is to set aside some time for quiet reflection, using meditation to inquire within. See Principle 47. After you become relaxed and enter into a state of deep self-love and peacefulness, ask yourself, what is my purpose for living? Or, what is my unique role in the universe? Allow the answer to simply come to you. Let it be as expansive as you can imagine. The words that come need not be flowery or poetic. What is important is how inspired the words make you feel. If you really want to go deep with this exercise, you can do two more exercises we do in my Breakthrough to Success training. The first is the Passion Test. It is a simple exercise you can go through alone or with a partner. The process can be found in the book The Passion Test by Janet and Chris Atwood. The other exercise, which many people find to be the most powerful, is the Life Purpose Guided Visualization, part of my Awakening Power set of meditations on CD. This six-CD program contains eleven guided visualizations narrated by myself and Dr. Deborah Sandella. You can order this audio program at www.jackcanfield.com. Principle 3. Decide what you want. The indispensable first step to getting the things you want out of life is this. Decide what you want. Ben Stein, actor and author. Once you have decided why you're here, you have to decide what you want to do, be, and have. What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to experience? And what possessions do you want to acquire? In the journey from where you are to where you want to be, you have to decide where you want to be. In other words, what does success look like to you? One of the main reasons why most people don't get what they want is they haven't decided what they want. They haven't defined their desires in clear and compelling detail. Early childhood programming often gets in the way of what you want. Inside every one of us is that tiny seed of the you that you are meant to become. Unfortunately, you may have buried this seed in response to your parents, teachers, coaches, and other adult role models as you were growing up. You started out as a baby knowing exactly what you wanted. You knew when you were hungry. You spit out the foods you didn't like and avidly devoured the ones you did. You had no trouble expressing your needs and wants. You simply cried loudly with no inhibitions or holding back until you got what you wanted. You were fed, changed, and held. As you got older, you crawled around and moved toward whatever held the most interest for you. You were clear about what you wanted, and you headed straight toward it with no fear. So what happened? Somewhere along the way, someone said, Don't touch that. Stay away from there. Keep your hands to yourself. Eat everything on your plate, whether you like it or not. You don't really feel that way. You don't really want that. You should be ashamed of yourself. Stop crying. Don't be such a baby. As you got older, you heard, You can't have everything you want simply because you want it. Money doesn't grow on trees. Can't you think of anybody but yourself? Stop being so selfish. Stop doing what you're doing and come do what I want you to do. Don't live someone else's dreams. After many years of these kinds of sanctions, most of us eventually lost touch with the needs of our bodies and the desires of our hearts, and somehow got stuck trying to figure out what other people wanted us to do. We learned how to act and how to be to get their approval. As a result, we now do a lot of things we don't want to do, but that please a lot of other people. We go to medical school because that is what Dad wanted for us. We get married to please our mother. 
We get a real job instead of pursuing a dream career in the arts. We go straight into graduate school instead of taking a year off and backpacking through Europe. In the name of being sensible, we end up becoming numb to our own desires. It's no wonder that when we ask many teenagers what they want to do or be, they honestly answer, I don't know. There are too many layers of shoulds, ought tos, and you'd betters piled on top of and suffocating what they really want. So how do you reclaim yourself and your true desires? How do you get back to what you really want with no fear, shame, or inhibition? How do you reconnect with your real passion? You start on the smallest level by honoring your preferences in every situation, no matter how large or small. Don't think of them as petty. They might be inconsequential to someone else, but they are not to you. Stop settling for less than you want. If you are going to reown your power and get what you really want out of life, you'll have to stop saying, I don't know, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me, or the current favorite of teenagers, whatever. When you are confronted with a choice, no matter how small or insignificant, act as if you have a preference. Ask yourself, if I did know, what would it be? If I did care, which would I prefer? If it did matter, what would I rather do? Not being clear about what you want and making other people's needs and desires more important than your own is simply a habit. You can break it by practicing the opposite habit. The Yellow Notebook Many years ago, I took a workshop with self-esteem and motivational expert Sherry Carter-Scott, author of If Life is a Game, These Are the Rules. As the twenty-four of us entered the training room on the first morning, we were directed to take a seat in one of the chairs facing the front of the room. There was a spiral-bound notebook on every chair. Some were blue, some were yellow, some were red. The one on my chair was yellow. I remember thinking, I hate yellow. I wish I had a blue one. Then Sherry said something that changed my life forever. If you don't like the color of the notebook you have, trade with someone else and get the one you want. You deserve to have everything in your life exactly the way you want it. Wow, what a radical concept. For twenty-some years, I had not operated from that premise. I had settled, thinking I couldn't have everything I wanted. So I turned to the person to my right and said, Would you mind trading your blue notebook for my yellow one? She responded, Not at all. I prefer yellow. I like the brightness of the color. I now had my blue notebook. Not a huge success in the greater scheme of things, but it was the beginning of reclaiming my birthright to acknowledge my preferences and get exactly what I want. Up until then, I would have discounted my preference as petty and not worth acting on. I would have continued to numb out my awareness of what I wanted. That day was a turning point for me. The beginning of allowing myself to know and act on my wants and desires in a much more powerful way. Make an I want list. One of the easiest ways to begin clarifying what you truly want is to make a list of 30 things you want to do, 30 things you want to have, and 30 things you want to be before you die. This is a great way to get the ball rolling. Another powerful technique to unearth your wants is to ask a friend to help you make an I want list. Have your friend continually ask, What do you want? What do you want for 10 to 15 minutes and jot down your answers? You'll find the first ones aren't all that profound. In fact, most people usually hear themselves saying, I want a Mercedes, I want a big house on the ocean, and so on. However, by the end of the 15-minute exercise, the real you begins to speak. I want people to love me. I want to express myself. I want to make a difference. I want to feel powerful. Ones that are more true expressions of your core values. Make a 20 things I love to do list. What often stops people from expressing their true desire is they don't think they can make a living doing what they love to do. What I love to do is hang out and talk with people, you might say. Well, Oprah Winfrey has made a living hanging out and talking with people for 30 years.
And my friend Diane Browse, who is an international tour guide, makes a living hanging out and talking with people in some of the most exciting and exotic locations in the world. Tiger Woods loves to play golf. Ellen DeGeneres loves to make people laugh. My sister, Kimberly Kerberger, loves to design jewelry. Donald Trump loves to make deals and build buildings. I love to read and share what I have learned with others in books, speeches, and workshops. It is possible to make a living doing what you love. Make a list of 20 things you love to do, and then think of ways you can make a living doing some of those things. If you love sports, you can play sports, be a sports writer or photographer, or work in sports management as an agent or in the front office of a professional team. You could be a coach, a manager, or a scout. You could be a broadcaster, a camera operator, or a team publicist. There are myriad ways to make money in any field that you love. For now, just decide what you like to do, and in the following chapters I'll show you how to be successful and make money at it. Clarify your vision of your ideal life. The theme of this book is how to get from where you are to where you want to be. To accomplish this, you have to know two things where you are, and where you want to get to. Your vision is a detailed description of where you want to get to. It describes in detail what your destination looks like and feels like. To create a balanced and successful life, your vision needs to include the following seven areas. Work and career, finances, recreation and free time, health and fitness, relationships, personal goals, and contribution to the larger community. At this stage in the journey, it is not necessary to know exactly how you are going to get there. All that is important is that you figure out where there is. If you get clear on the what, the how will show up. Your Inner Global Positioning System The process of getting from where you are to where you want to be is like using the GPS, Global Positioning System technology, in your car or smartphone. For the system to work, it simply needs to know where you are now and where you want to go. The navigation system figures out where you are by the use of an onboard computer that receives signals from multiple satellites and calculates your exact position. When you type in your destination, the navigational system plots a perfect course for you. All you have to do is follow the instructions. Success in life works the same way. All you have to do is decide where you want to go by clarifying your vision, then lock in the destination through goal-setting, affirmations, and visualization, and then start moving in the right direction. Your inner GPS will keep unfolding your route as you continue to move forward. In other words, once you clarify and stay focused on your vision, the exact steps will keep appearing along the way. Once you are clear about what you want and keep your mind constantly focused on it, the how will keep showing up, sometimes just when you need it, and not a moment earlier. High Achievers Have Bigger Visions The greater danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. Michelangelo, Renaissance sculptor and painter who spent four years lying on his back painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I want to encourage you not to limit your vision in any way. Let it be as big as it is. When I interviewed Dave Linegar, chairman of the board of Remax, the country's largest franchise real estate company, he told me, always dream big dreams. Big dreams attract big people. General Wesley Clark, the former supreme allied commander of NATO forces in Europe, once told me, it doesn't take any more energy to create a big dream than it does to create a little one. My experience is that one of the few differences between the superachievers and the rest of the world is that the superachievers simply dream bigger. John F. Kennedy dreamed of putting a man on the moon. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed of a country free of prejudice and injustice. Bill Gates dreams of a world in which every home has a computer that is connected to the Internet. Buckminster Fuller dreamed of a world where everybody had access to electrical power. These high achievers see the world from a whole different perspective, as a place where amazing things can happen, where billions of lives can be improved, 
where new technology can change the way we live and where the world's resources can be leveraged for the greatest possible mutual gain. They believe anything is possible, and they believe they have an integral part in creating it. When Mark Victor Hansen and I first published Chicken Soup for the Soul, what we call our 2020 vision was also a big one, to sell one billion chicken soup books and to raise $500 million for charity through tithing a portion of all of our profits by the year 2020. We were and are very clear about what we want to accomplish. As of 2015, we have already sold more than 500 million copies in 47 languages. If you limit your choices only to what seems possible or reasonable, you disconnect yourself from what you truly want, and all that is left is a compromise. Robert Fritz, author of The Path of Least Resistance Don't let anyone talk you out of your vision. There are people who will try to talk you out of your vision. They will tell you that you are crazy and that it can't be done. My friend Monty Roberts, author of The Man Who Listens to Horses, which spent 58 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, calls these people dream stealers. Don't listen to them. When Monty was in high school, his teacher gave the class an assignment to write about what they wanted to do when they grew up. Monty wrote that he wanted to own a 200-acre ranch and raise thoroughbred racehorses. His teacher gave him an F and explained the grade reflected that he deemed Monty's dream unrealistic. No boy who was living in a camper on the back of a pickup truck would ever be able to amass enough money to buy a ranch, purchase breeding stock, and pay the necessary salaries for ranch hands. When he offered Monty the chance of rewriting his paper for a higher grade, Monty told him, You keep the F. I'm keeping my dream. Today, Monty's 154-acre Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California, raises thoroughbred racehorses and trains hundreds of horse trainers in a more humane way to join up with and train horses. To learn more about Monty and his work, go to www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources or read one of his books. The Man Who Listens to Horses, Shy Boy, Horse Sense for People, and From My Hands to Yours. His work has produced eight national champions in the show rings of the world and more than 300 international stakes winners in thoroughbred racing. The Vision Exercise Create your future from your future, not your past. Werner Erhardt, founder of Est Training and the Landmark Forum. The following exercise is designed to help you clarify your vision. Start by putting on some relaxing music and sitting quietly in a comfortable environment where you won't be disturbed. Then, close your eyes and ask your subconscious mind to give you images of what your ideal life would look like if you could have it exactly the way you want it, in each of the following categories. 1. First, focus on the financial area of your life. What is your ideal annual income and monthly cash flow? How much money do you have in savings and investments? What is your total net worth? Next, what does your home look like? Where is it located? Does it have a view? What kind of yard and landscaping does it have? Is there a pool or a stable for horses? What does the furniture look like? Are there paintings hanging in the rooms? Walk through your perfect house, filling in all of the details. At this point, don't worry about how you'll get that house. Don't sabotage yourself by saying, I can't live in Malibu because I don't make enough money. Once you give your mind's eye the picture, your mind will solve the not-enough-money challenge. Next, visualize what kind of car you are driving and any other important possessions your finances have provided. 2. Next, visualize your ideal job or career. Where are you working? What are you doing? With whom are you working? What kind of clients or customers do you have? What is your compensation like? Is it your own business? 3. Then focus on your free time, your recreation time. 
What are you doing with your family and friends in the free time you've created for yourself? What hobbies are you pursuing? What kinds of vacations do you take? What do you do for fun? 4. Next, what is your ideal vision of your body and your physical health? Are you free of all disease? Are you pain-free? How long do you live? Are you open, relaxed, in an ecstatic state of bliss all day long? Are you full of vitality? Are you flexible as well as strong? Do you exercise, eat good food, and drink lots of water? How much do you weigh? 5. Then move on to your ideal vision of your relationships with your family and friends. What is your relationship with your spouse and family like? Who are your friends? What do these friendships feel like? Are those relationships loving, supportive, empowering? What kinds of things do you do together? 6. What about the personal arena of your life? Do you see yourself going back to school, getting training, attending personal growth workshops, seeking therapy for a past hurt, or growing spiritually? Do you meditate or go on spiritual retreats with your church? Do you want to learn to play an instrument or write your autobiography? Do you want to run a marathon or take an art class? Do you want to travel to other countries? 7. Finally, focus on the community you've chosen to live in. What does it look like when it is operating perfectly? What kinds of community activities take place there? What charitable, philanthropic, or volunteer work? What do you do to help others and make a difference? How often do you participate in these activities? Who are you helping? You can write down your answers as you go. Or you can do the whole exercise first and then open your eyes and write them down. In either case, make sure you capture everything in writing as soon as you complete the exercise. Every day, review the vision you have written down. This will keep your conscious and subconscious minds focused on your vision. And as you apply the other principles in this book, you will begin to manifest all the different aspects of your vision.